Welcome to the COP28 uh, post-match analysis. The, this post-match analysis after the climate negotiations is now a tradition. We're very happy to have a fantastic panel to discuss uh, issues that were negotiated at the COP and the outcome uh, where the panel has different expertise and, and insights into the broad uh, agenda that was discussed in, in Dubai. Uh, and we also have... Uh, a fantastic audience so that's that's great to see uh, in the panel we have um, in alphabetical order Maria Janes who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research here at Linköping University Matthias Frimeri who is Sweden's climate ambassador and head of delegations to the UNCCC and uh, and uh, also at the Swedish Ministry for Climate and Enterprise uh, we also have uh, Ricardo Marshall, director of the Route to REAPS uh, program at the Prime Minister's office in Barbados. Uh, Emma Modé-Riking, who is the global head of international sustainable business at Business Sweden. And Åsa Persson, who is research director and deputy director at the Stockholm Environment Institute. She is also chair of the Swedish Climate Policy Council and a professor at the Linköping University in Environmental Change. And these five in the panel will then have a discussion, but we would also very much like to invite the audience to post questions. If you put them in the chat, uh, Tina Nieset, uh, who is the director of the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research, uh, will then post them on your behalf uh, to the panelists. So uh, that would be great. We will start with a round uh, of questions to all the panelists and then some specific questions and then uh, at least two times uh, stop to uh, add some questions from the panel before we round it up with the final questions to all the panelists. So welcome again. The first question which we pose every year is uh, uh, to the panelists is what will be remembered in 10 years time from the COP? So what will be remembered from COP? 28 in 10 years time that's the first round of questions should we start with the uh, with the alphabetical order again then maria would you like to start sure thank you um so i have two answers to this question so one is that i sincerely hope that we remember this cop for all the fuss around the host country and that there was such resistance to this language on phasing out fossil fuels and i hope that we will remember it as a past time in which we're still debating these issues and as a last sigh of the, the fossil area. That's my hope. But what I fear is that we will instead remember this COP as providing much too weak language and outcomes. And despite we all, all that we know, and despite having at least a slight chance of um, keeping within the 1.5. Um, so I fear that we will remember it as another one in a long row of too little, too late, unfortunately. Matthias. What will? What do you think we will remember in ten years' time? Well, I, I think we'll remember this COP for sort of uh, the um, the same sort of the same line of thinking as Maria, but actually from the other perspective. I think we'll remember this COP as the first COP when we did actually have uh, a first in terms of. Um, the dimensioning of all fossil fuels. And I mean, that's the framing now was the transitioning away from fossil fuels and energy systems. And of course we can debate that that is not, it, it's not enough. Uh, we had hoped for more, but still it's the first um, that we get that kind of mention and an agreement by all parties in all countries to actually uh, mark the end of the fossil era as many of us had said. And I think that's what we will be, that what COP28 will be rem remembered for. Well, fantastic hope to have, yeah. Uh, Ricardo, what, what do you think? Hi, good morning from my side of the world. Good afternoon to you all. Um, for me, I think what COP will always be remembered as under COP28 is for the establishment of the loss and damage fund and the fact that it was done in the first plenary session of the COP. Um, I think there, there are a number of other narratives that are out there but certainly the establishment of the loss and damage fund from someone who was actually part of the transitional committee, I think is, is a phenomenal thing, especially for small island developing states and LDCs. Thank you. Yeah, we will come back to the loss and damage in the 
questions eventually. Uh, Emma, and I should say Emma has a fever. So we know if you need to take a pause, you're more than- Thank you so much. We understand you perfectly, but thanks um, for joining us anyway. Super happy to participate, uh, regardless of the fever, of course. And uh, I agree with the previous uh, speakers. And of course, the loss and damage uh, fund is uh, pivotal, but I also agree with the Matildas that I, I hope that this COP will best be remembered for the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era and the fact that we actually include uh, the transitioning away from fossil fuels and also reference this for the first time in the climate agreement is it's it's major and of course and while we didn't turn the page on the fossil fuel era with a full phase out of the fossil fuels in the gst text it does indeed break a new ground and it really also makes a welcoming start let's say uh, to advance the discourse on phasing out the, the fossil fuels and i think also it's important to mention also the, the GST and the um, clear signal where we're heading in terms of also tripling uh, renewable energy capacity globally and also double um, the global average annual rate on energy efficiency improvements by 2030. And I think also considering uh, that we were also representing the private sector in, at, uh, at COP28, I think it's also important to mention the fact that it was the largest COP ever, and also the importance of the non-negotiating and the non-state actors at, uh, at COP28. Thank you. Yeah, we will come back to that as well. Uh, finally then, Osa, what do you think we will remember in a decade? Yeah, thank you for the, the question and, and um, uh, for inviting us to this webinar. Uh, my hope is that we will remember COP28 as the last COP before the global peak of CO2 emissions. Um, it could happen next year. We don't know exactly when, but I think the significance of that is that I, you know, it, it um, could have been one of the last COPs where we still had this very difficult politics. Uh, I think that global peak of CO2 emissions could be an important psychological turning point uh, when we start seeing the solutions more clearly. That's my hope, uh, but I do think um, COP28 will be remembered for the establishment of the loss and damage fund, just like Ricardo uh, said. Um, I, I think for me, the fossil fuel language and also the global goals on renewables and energy efficiency um, are important steps, but maybe not maybe not as historic as, as we think at the moment, but let's discuss more. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, so pretty high hopes anyway that we will remember this COP in a positive way. And so uh, that's interesting. So, and what you have said so far, I think it's it's, it's really interesting with the different than emphasis, of course, from the agenda, but, but this is something that has been discussed and reported. So my next question is, of course, to you, what, what has not been reported, what has not been in the media focus or, or reported your insider tip on what was important that happened at, at uh, COP28 that was not talked about so much or, or reported from Dubai? Should we start in the reverse order now then, Osa? Would you like to go again? Sure, I'll jump in. I would say things that I will keep an eye on going forward is particularly um, methane and energy efficiency. Uh, methane, because it's now uh, becoming, it's more in the spotlight again. Uh, we talked about mainly methane emissions from the oil and gas sector in Dubai, but I think also the agricultural sector, livestock will, you know, hopefully soon be more on the agenda. Uh, good to see action and progress on that one. Uh, I will also say energy efficiency. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, but I understood that this global goal to double the rate of energy efficiency is quite challenging. So it will be very interesting to see how actors tackle that goal. And I think it's a very important part of the solution here. It's not just about expanding renewables, but really becoming more efficient. And I think this nicely connects also with um, sort of lifestyle issues more broadly. Thanks. Thanks. Emma? I think what media covers and I mean, have maybe forgotten or not been able to cover is, of course, everything that happens behind the scenes. And considering, once again, this was the largest COP ever in ever and more than 85,000 delegates from all over the world. There's, of course, a lot to cover, but I think it's also typically a large focus on the negotiations 
rightly so, of course, but the challenges and the, the difficulties, I think we are lacking the perspective of all the solutions and the opportunities that also the green transition brings. And, and also what has then been discussed among all the non-state actors that are participating from the private sector, from civil society, from academia and, and so forth that are also at COP28. And, and as we've also been discussing uh, in previous uh, events and discussions, we've also the fact that there's such a disconnection uh, between the negotiations and the different pavilions and side events that are focusing heavily on the solutions and concrete actions on how we can bridge the implementation gaps and sometimes we also see a knowledge gap between the um, maybe the decision makers knowledge of the solutions that actually exist and also the concrete actions on how they can be implemented and scaled um, that is what I miss uh, from uh, the media coverage I'd say thank you uh, Ricardo thank you so much um, I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective from someone who is actively involved in the negotiations. Um, I specifically tend to cover um, the climate finance area, but of course, um, once you're covering finance, you're also covering means of implementation under the mitigation work program, under the GGA, under the GST, et cetera. Um, but I also had 20 plus odd speaking engagements outside and I chaired one of the agenda items. Um, there are two things that I think stick out to me that the media didn't carry. Um, there was very much of a focus on developed countries seen as supporting SIDS and LDCs relative to the phase out of fossil fuels. But there's an entire geopolitical sphere being missed there in unabated fossil fuels. And the idea being that those who can pay for abatement can get to hold on to exploiting their fossil fuels much longer. And... So I think the medium missed the trick there because honestly, it is not as though the Australias, the USAs, the Canadas, the Norways, the United Kingdoms of this world are actually looking to be on the side of SIDS. I think some of us in the SIDS perspective know a lot better. Um, the second matter that I think that the medium misses but is very, very critical in this is the difference in views between the developed and the developing countries relative to what we call the COP and the CMA. That is the convention itself and the Paris Agreement. And there's a move by developed countries to bring parity at least between the convention and the Paris Agreement and developing countries see it in very much a light as sidelining the convention um, towards the benefits that developed countries perceive can be brought by what is under the Paris Agreement. And this was played out actually in the agenda item that I chaired under the seventh review of the financial mechanism. And you will see that there was a text that went forward to the final plenary that ended up under Rule 16 by the U.S., and the EU as the predominant objectors to what was put forward. Yeah, and the rule number 16, uh, rule 16, you, maybe you can, can enlighten the audience on. Essentially, that. that means that there is no agreed decision on it because we work by consensus in the process and you therefore had no agreement and therefore no conducting of the seventh review of the financial mechanism. And this was the third consecutive year that there was no result and this means, therefore, that there is not going to be a seventh review. And it is likely that the same issues will go over into the eighth review. And mm -hmm. there is a very strong belief by a number of developing countries that developed countries are using this A to force parity between the Paris Agreement and the Convention, but also B to prevent there from being a reporting on what is the scale and the success relative to the financing that is provided under Articles 4.5 and 9 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, very interesting. We, we come, perhaps we can come back to that and have, a, have Matthias' views on, on that. Also, when we discuss the global goal orientation with you, Chad, where similar discussions, I think, when it, when it comes to the what should be in from the UNFCCC and what should be from sort of within the Paris Agreement was was raised. If I'm correct, you can return to that, Matthias. Uh, yes, Penny then. 
um, Maria. No, Matthias. I we have two. Sorry, Matthias and then Maria. Yeah, thanks, Pianola. I mean, no, indeed, I'd be happy to do a bit of a deep dive on the issue that Ricardo raised, uh, specifically on this distinction between the COP and CMA agendas. I mean, maybe it's not, it's understandable why the media maybe not pick it up, but indeed it is uh, sort of a, it, 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 uh, it touches a very, you know, issues of principle in terms of, you know, how the, how the whole pro COP process is set up. So I, I think definitely it's something worth, worth at least discussing in this context, maybe not in the media itself. But the, the, the issue that I wanted to highlight uh, for in relation to this question was exactly what, uh, what Emma was pointing to as well. I mean, there has been a lot of reports in terms of, at least in, in the Swedish media, in terms of what the business community does in terms to, to sort of to support acceleration of the transition globally. Um, but I do think that, you know, that is still something which would be useful to have even more widely reported in terms of highlighting the opportunities that we see in climate action globally. And I mean, if, if that would be more widely reported, we would also hopefully uh, spur action in more countries in terms of what countries can do actually to, to accelerate their transition and highlighting the kind of solutions that are available uh, where as you know, as Emma was saying as well, you know what we often encounter in the negotiation rooms, where also, I mean, as as Ricardo pointed out, there are there are differences of views, and your countries perceive the transition differently, because we have different starting points. Um, but what we strongly believe from the Swedish and the EU perspective is that by highlighting these opportunities and how you know what kind of policies can we design in order to accelerate the transition to bring about the new jobs and growth needed, uh, you know, we we think that we would be able to make more headway in the transition globally and also within negotiations themselves. So that's an issue which maybe we can see more of reporting for not only at the COP next year, but also throughout next year. Thank you, Matthias. Maria. Thank you, Vinola. Yes. Um, so I think that um, partly what the media missed, or at least that it's not as prominent, is how much is about this implementation gap. So there's a lot of talk about the ambitions, uh, especially now that we had so much talk about the fossil fuel phase out potential um, and ambitions are great and plans and strategies are great and they are needed, but they will not re reduce emissions or contribute to adaptation unless they are implemented. And in my view, at least means of implementation, meaning support in terms of money, technology transfer and capacity building was really the talk of the town at, at COP28. And it is, of course, about implementing climate action to mitigate and adapt to climate change. But it is, as Ricardo was also pointing out, it's a source of mistrust, both among parties, but also among parties and observers. For example, this issue of have developed countries really met the climate finance goal of 100 billion per year, or have they not? Or the fact that developing countries argue that they have drawn up ambitious plans, but that the level of support is not aligned with what is needed. So these issues might be a little bit harder to reflect in the media, but in my view, they are really core to the climate negotiations and would deserve some more uh, attention. Thanks. Thanks so much. But before we start, uh, continue with the questions, specific questions, uh, Ricardo mentioned geopolitics, and then I remember that I forgot, in spite having good instructions, to say who is uh, hosting this event. And I also forgot to say who I am. I'm a Bianula Linera. I'm a professor at Linkshipping University and also program director for Mr. Geopolitics uh, Research Program and uh, an affiliate to Stockholm and Mind Institute. And all these three are ho hosting this session. So Stockholm and Mind Institute, Linkshipping University, and the Mr. Geopolitics Program. So that said, let's dive into continue with the discussions. So at the closing of uh, COP28, the UN climate chief, uh, Simon Steele, said that this is not the finish line, uh, it's, uh, but it's a lifeline for 1.5. And I've been to a number of COPs, as, as you have as well. And this is sort of the story that we tell after every COP that, well, this is not what we wanted, but the door to, to, for 1.5 is still, is still open. It's still within reach. How, how many years can we say that? Is this really a lifeline or, or, or has that ship sailed on a rising tide uh, will the next global stock take will we still be in the carbon budget for 1.5 by the next global stock take or we have used the remaining budget i think that that might be a core question but you seem many of you seem quite optimistic that we will this will turn the tide but what do you think ricardo 
it is an interesting question and one that I, I struggle to be as optimistic as as many others on. Um, one point five is on life support. Let mm -hmm. us be very very real. Um, I think from the perspective of the small island development states and having been in the AOSIS room and um, been participating in the discussions, we are literally fighting for survival and we do not believe that that is really being um, affected, that there's a lot of lip service being paid without very real action. Um, a good example is this call for phase out versus phase down with a focus really being on unabated fossil fuels rather than really phasing out. When you look at it, some of the very countries who are calling for that phase out have increased their ports for exporting oil and gas this year. Um, I will not name those, but there are a few in my region of the world. Um, in addition, the, the developed countries are putting a lot of pressure on developing countries to speed up the mitigation in their own country. And again, this is tied to the COP versus CMA matter. And it has seemingly been forgotten that some 80% of the current global emissions come from those developing those developed countries. Um, and along the line that we're pushing, it is the small and poor um, producers um, of oil and gas that are going to be squeezed out first and whose development trajectory is being curtailed. Um, I'll give you some examples just from my region. Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Venezuela, Suriname. These are going to be the last in and the first out the door. Um, so when we speak on 1.5, we have to consider what has been the historical action and what we're putting forward as the actions going forward. If you cannot understand the link between climate change and development and the need for um, individual countries to address their poverty, to address their individual adaptation needs, um, you're never going to get there. 1.5 is on life support, but development for the developing countries of the world is also on life support. And we have to find a way to tie those two things together. You know, like, could I come in there? Please. Uh, uh, you know, to be to be quite frank, something. I mean, I, Ricardo, I wonder if if we were we weren't in the same rooms, I guess. Uh, but I mean, I think just sort of to to touch on that point, because I mean, we have obviously done a very bad job from the EU side uh, when you perceive uh, the EU as not taking developing countries' perspectives into account. I mean, we've been very clear in the EU conclusions ahead of COP28 that it is for the G20 who stand for 80% of global emissions who need to accelerate their work. Um, and if they don't, then definitely 1.5 will be in danger. And this is China, this is India, this is Russia, this is South Africa, this is Brazil, including the EU and the EUS and Canada. So it's G20 countries which need, which need to accelerate their action in, on mitigation in order for us to be able to keep 1.5 alive. Um, obviously, all countries, according to the Paris Agreement, need to come forward with new NDCs ahead of COP30 in 2025. But at least from the EU side, our expectation is that the bulk of the mitigation action needs to come from the G20 countries and not from developing countries at large. And that also, I think, touches to the point on um, the sort of uh, this COP CMA issue where we from the EU side and, and sort of um, I wouldn't share your sense that you know that we from the and again you know we've, we've obviously been doing a good job bad job in communications here because we i don't see that we're sort of trying to uh, what's the word you use sort of to sideline the convention in relation to the paris agreement but rather you know the, for us these are two international agreements sort of on parity al already so you know we shouldn't be saying you know it's one it's one or the other it's both i mean obviously we think that the paris agreement sort of has a more elaborated approach to climate action. But I mean, the principles of the convention are established also in the Paris Agreement. So, I mean, those are sort of carried through the Paris Agreement itself. But our concern when, you know, and the example you mentioned on the financial mechanism is that since the financial mechanism serves both the convention and the Paris Agreement, obviously those decisions need to be taken under both. 
And as long as we have that system with, you know, the three agendas as we have for the COP CMA and the CMP, uh, you know, either we just merge them into one uh, and we could have one consolidated approach or we treat those, um, we treat the, treat the treaties equally uh, you know between uh, between in this case the two or the cmp also when it comes to the adaptation fund uh, so i mean again you know i think uh, from our perspective um, the bulk of the mitigation action needs to come from uh, the g20 including the eu and the eu and the us uh, and we expect all countries, yes, to come forward with NDCs, uh, which should represent the progression, be, econ be economy-wide over time, and also include all gases, I mean, as we've stated now, in the GST decision. But of course, for many countries, it is adaptation, which is sort of a, a key element in um, sort of the, the, the bulk of their climate action. But we, uh, you know, we're there to and hope to be working with all parties in terms of accelerating climate action globally and also again coming back to the opportunities and highlighting what we can see as you know what, what brings us all growth and jobs uh, for all countries and in putting in place those kind of solutions that we see are available thanks Matthias and Ricardo if you want to respond you can we can uh, I, I will let you in soon but uh, also also want to have a uh, a comment on this Yes, uh, just a brief comment, not not on the real uh, politics or negotiations as such, but I thought I could offer a scientific perspective. Um, so before COP on, on this question of, you know, is, is 1.5 degree target, is it still feasible? Uh, I was part of a report uh, ahead of COP uh, called 10 New Climate Science Insights, where we look at the latest uh, science. And one of the insights related to exactly the 1.5 degree target, and uh, we were discussing at length how to, you know, what can we say about it? And we ended up saying that it's fast becoming inevitable, uh, overshooting the 1.5 degree target. So that's the, the wording we chose. Uh, but what I think, uh, what we also say in that report is that what, what really matters now is not about, you know, dropping that target if we can't uh, limit warming to 1.5. That's the, a flawed conclusion from the science. It's rather about minimizing the magnitude and the duration of overshoot. So I, uh, if I were to guess about the future of, of COPs and the whole climate discourse, maybe this is where it will go. Uh, how do we limit the, the magnitude and the duration of the overshoot? Thanks, Osa. Ricardo. Thank you so much. I think, Matthias, and I could probably have the entire program, but we, we shouldn't, so I won't. Um, but I would say that we believe firmly that there is a requirement from all of the countries in the G20 to act, but there's also a requirement indeed outlined in, in Article 9 of the Paris Agreement that states very clearly that developed countries should take the lead. And we want to see that. Um, these are the countries that have taken the lead in historic emissions, and they need to take the lead both in terms of actions for mitigation as well as financing. And I think what you will find is that there are a lot of developing countries that are very nervous about what they put in their NDCs. I come from a country that has one of the most ambitious NDCs, and so I can speak freely on it. But the reality is that developing countries are held to account whenever they put anything on paper. And there is a fear that you do not play on a level playing field, because if you take the example of the 100 billion. It is clear that developed countries are not held to the same standard. There is tremendous request from the developed countries right now to be taken at their word that the 100 billion has been achieved. When you speak to each developed country, all of them have a different understanding as to what the 100 billion is, how much is public financing versus how much is private financing. And you cannot see anywhere where the numbers have been presented that say that the 100 billion has been achieved. Yet the developing countries have been asked to produce NAMAs, NAPs, NDCs, investment plans. Now we're dealing with a GGA, a GST, and it's going and going in that direction. And I, I will speak very frankly, the developing countries do not believe that there's anything like a level playing field. Um, I speak to my EU colleagues often, and I have a good relationship with them, but I'm just saying that that is the perspective that is coming from our side. 
Thanks. I, I would love to have a uh, here uh, the conversation between the two of you for one and a half hours. So maybe that's our follow up. That would be great. Uh, yes, and we'll be return to the issue on, on finance soon. But uh, I would uh, like to continue with Maria. So the COP presidency was heavily criticized before the COP, but you all seem pretty, at least somewhat content or at least see some positive outcomes of the COP. So did the Al Jaber prove the critics wrong? Uh, the, was the or was the presidency good or bad for the Paris Agreement? Well, that's a tough question, right? Because we will never know the outcome of COP28 with another presidency and another president. Um, I think that from the observer point of view, he was very clear throughout on pushing the 1.5 degree target as the North Star and pushing parties to compromise. And of course, Matthias and Ricardo would have more of an insider view of what happens behind closed doors. Um, it also seems, at least from the outside, that uh, most countries were quite happy about the negotiating process, which uh, is always important to keep trust within, um, within the group of countries. Uh, with the notable exception then of AOSIS at the closing plenary uh, on the G's to deal. Um, I think that there was a lot of pressure as well to get a good deal, especially on the, the global stock take, and that the stakes were really high for Al Jaber and also uh, the UAE to really prove their capacity to take on this presidency and also push countries to reach the joint goals of the convention and the Paris Agreement rather than working in their own self-interest. And I'm not convinced that another president would have found a stronger outcome of the GSD, but I would be happy to hear what the other one's um, reflections are as well. Yeah, Ricardo, could we have your perspective on, on the pros and cons of having an oil executive as the president of a COP? Certainly. Um, I think that um, Sultan al Jaber did an incredible job. Um, it was a very difficult ask of him and the UAE. Um, we stood at that point in time um, on very shaky ground. And I, I think that his presence, and this is something that I guess very few persons would know, um, essentially without the UAE, we would not have had a transitional committee meeting number five. It is therefore unlikely that we would have had a loss and damage fund. And just that presence, he did not intercede in any way in the discussions, but he just was there to let you know that he wants a positive outcome. And I think that he was forceful throughout the process without crossing the line. And I will say having um, chaired um, agenda items at other COPs, that this presidency was exceedingly good at interacting with co-chairs and co-facilitators to ensure that the process was moving behind the scenes and that even where there was not agreement of parties, that parties were really vacillating um, and discussing the issues, um, ventilating, sorry, and discussing the issues. And so I think that, that it was a, an excellent job and a positive outcome. We would always like more, but I think you have to give credit where credit is due. Thanks, thanks. Uh, anybody would like to raise criticism towards the presidency? Now, oh, this is a fairly positive panel, I guess, in that regard. I think we have some, might have some comments in the chat uh, with uh, other views that would be interesting to hear. Uh, but thanks, thanks a lot. Very interesting with that perspective from the inside uh, in that regard. Emma, we saw an impressive amount of Swedish companies. Uh, I was there for the opening of the Swedish pavilion and I was impressed by the program uh, that you brought there. But one thing that we've seen a criticism when in the discussion for the reform of the unit we perceive something it's turning into a market fair and that is not then a, in a po seen as something positive. Maybe you have another view on that. But, but all this sort of this participation from uh, from business, do we some, see some tangible outcome of that? Or are they just marketing their own businesses? 
great question and it's important of course and but i think i would like to touch upon the, the fact what matthias also mentioned the fact that we need to highlight the opportunities and the solutions and the possibilities that that can bring into the negotiations if we know of the not only about the challenges and and but also the needs and the possibilities and also what ricardo just said as well clarify the link between the climate challenges and the needs and here i think i mean science uh, we've known for a long time what the challenges are but we need to clarify what do they really mean and then in the same way it's equally important to understand not only what are the scientifically proven challenges but also then the solutions and like in the light of the urgency and in the light of the climate crisis we see that we are did it go in the wrong direction by like only 15 percent of the un climate goals uh, um, global goals that are on track basically 85 percent are stalled or even going in reverse and six out of nine planetary boundaries that are already crossed and the corridor of life are just being more, becoming more and more narrow and also as we've seen especially also in in this cop and the, where we see the, the blocking um in terms of the um, possibilities to to phase out i mean to, to write the phase out the fossil fuels we see that the political and economic uh, logical is so uh, vital and it's so big in the negotiations and it's really blocking and we see that um the, I mean, the possibilities or the difficulties we've seen in actually phasing out the fossil fuels is also, of course, because so many countries are dependent on uh, fossil fuels as a large part of the GDP. And also, we still have a lot of fossil subsidies. And last year, we have a record high of the fossil subsidies, spending over seven uh, trillion US dollar in fossil subsidies last year, which is more than the governments are spending on education and, and almost as much as we're spending on health. Here. So here I think it's really important to then bridge the gap between the, the scientifically like proven challenges and the needs, the negotiation topics, and then really showcasing the solution, existing solutions. And that's what we are aiming to do, to clarify once again what solutions exist today, how can they be implemented, and what policies are needed. And if we really made sure that the gaps and the silos between the negotiators and the decision makers and this non-state actors would actually come together i'm sure we could lay out the the issues and the solutions and have more of a matchmaking process between the the challenges and the solutions so what we did what were to really act as this kind of platform for matchmaking and and also sometimes i mean we at this in sweden talk of the fact that we try to be as like climate tinders matching climate global climate solutions and sustainable solutions and with sustainable solutions it is of course technical solutions but it's also financial solutions and it's also policy uh, frameworks and solutions and and also science are showing that the innovations and the solutions exist to mitigate the worst effect of climate change so the more we can clarify those solutions and uh, make sure that the negotiators and the decision makers are aware of them well hopefully like also Matilda said it can spur some some actions in negotiation rooms and also maybe there will be more bold uh, to to push the agenda and take necessary actions and and also i think it's important to mention the fact that policies in itself will not solve the climate crisis and finance itself will not uh, solve the climate cr crisis nor we, we cannot innovate ourselves like out of the climate crisis either all of these different perspectives are interconnected and that's why all these perspectives needs to be represented there and uh, we have seen fantastic outcomes in terms of um stakeholders coming together, creating new um, collaborations, new innovations that has been developed thanks to the fact that they've been coming together and also new ways of implementing them globally. So we see really positive results of it um, throughout the years that we've been at uh, COP together with a, the Swedish front running companies that all have really high climate commitments in place and they also have solutions that can help other countries and countries to with their transition journeys thanks uh, we we have uh both you and ricardo mentioned the the uh finance so before we take questions from the audience time is running up so so we well it's, it's a great discussion but so I, I would just like to 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 dwell a bit on on the finance which is a critical issue of course uh the the high-level expert group on climate finance, uh, which uh, were, are led or spearheaded by Vera Songwe and, and Nicholas Stern, which are famous economists, that they concluded before 
the the COP28 that the world is badly off track of the Paris Agreement, of course, which we can see in the global stock take. Uh, but their assessment is that it would require 2.4 trillion US dollars of investments in developing countries a year by 2030 to be on track of the climate goals for the Paris Agreement, then both mitigation and, and adaptation. So is that even possible? And how would that be, be achieved? Or, or we have sort of all these grants targets, which I think you mentioned also, Emma, with the energy uh, uh, renewable, tripling the capacity for renewable energy and doubling energy efficiency and so on. Also, you also mentioned this, right? But, but is it possible then if the funding is not there? Because there's a huge gap. It's not only the, the 100 billion then that, that the, the world, that the developed countries promised already in Copenhagen, which Ricardo had. But uh, but then it's it's an enormous amount of of funding. So what what can be done, Osa? What what is your what is your lifeline here for the world? Uh, I don't think it's you know impossible at all. And and just to put that uh, figure in in context, the two point um, four trillion. You know how much is that? It's it's about it's just over the amount that the world spends on military expenditure per year. It's about uh, four times the Sweden's GDP, and it's about ten percent of U.S. GDP. So I mean, of course, it's it's a huge investment we need to make, but it's not insurmountable. And uh, when, when I uh, talk to our sustainable finance experts at FBI, um, I, you know, the, the picture is really that it's not so much an issue of volume of capital in the world. But really about uh, allocation and access and ensuring project viability. So these are more you know technical terms. But uh, as as we know, so much of the current investment, which is not up to that level of the two point four trillion, but the current investments are very uh, strongly concentrated to China, to the EU, to the US. Uh, very little of that money goes to Africa, for example. So it, it's an allocation issue, it's an access issue, particularly when we look at the public funds, um, climate finance funds, and this is something that I think uh, needs to be highlighted more. And it, it's frustrating even to see NDCs and maps that have really identified needs and sort of concrete opportunities and projects that they struggle to actually secure the finance to implement them. Uh, so, so it's a question of access and finally, uh, if we look more at private capital, uh, it's it's a lot about project viability. So we still have uh, perceived risk in many contexts. So it, it is very hard to channel the investments to places where where that capital is needed, um, and uh, and to scale that up in in a quick way. So actually, um, what you know, my colleagues have been in, writing about and researching is not that you know. Yes, we need to talk about the you know from the billions to the trillions. That's a great vision, but we also need to actually deliver the billions in the first place. Uh, and then we need to have a much more sophisticated understanding of, of the, uh, how to limit um, uh, risk and ensure return. So uh, I definitely think it's a solvable problem. Um, it was interesting that we did not hear so much discussion in my view, and maybe others have a different view from, especially from inside the negotiation rooms. Uh, we did not hear so much about this discussion about the international financial architecture, this issue that has come up at every global summit this year um, in the UN and of the Paris summit, the Nairobi summit, etc. So it will be interesting to, to understand that better, uh, why that is. Um, but uh, clearly it's a little bit of a football being kicked around, but it's not, we haven't really scored a goal yet on that one. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd love to hear your views here, Ricardo. Uh, also, yeah, as you mentioned, that debt relief was only mentioned once in the whole in the whole document, and, and which surprised me a bit that it was not more topical in, in, in Dubai since it's been so much discussed in, uh, after the Bridgetown Initiative, the Paris uh, Financial Summit, and, and the Nairobi Summit. Ricardo, please. Thank you so much. I think um, perhaps I'm, I'm one of these strange people, given the fact that my wife is the Deputy Director of the Bridgetown Initiative Unit here, and Avinash Pasad, who is actually one of the co-authors on the same report, 
And the architect of the Bridgetown Initiative is a personal friend. And so these are literally discussions that we have in my home every day. Um, I think, first of all, it is to say that there are actions that happen within the convention and the negotiation space and actions that happen outside of it. And the issue of finance and the global financial architecture is actually something that is discussed at COP, but not in the negotiating rooms. And therefore, that's not where you're going to hear it come from. The, the predominant issue here is that the global financial architecture is not fit for purpose. I would not say it is broken because I think it serves the purpose that it was designed to serve, which was um, the Bretton Woods institutions to get Europe back on their feet after the war. But what that does not account for is the needs of countries, most of whom did not even exist when the Bretton Woods institutions were created. Um, in addition to that, again, we get back to a playing field that is not level. If I want to conduct a project in South Africa versus in Norway on renewable energy, the playing field is not level. When you look at the risks that are assumed, um, including things like the um, FX risk, that changes the equation and puts you from something that you're dealing with financing at 4% over 35 years to financing at 10 or 12% over 20 years. And so if, if you do not address those issues, then you won't be able to bring that in. Countries are being told that just simply by existing, that the risks are there. And when you are like mine, existing on the front lines of a climate crisis, where every single year we play Russian roulette with hurricanes, whether or not we're hit, our insurance premiums go up because we have a big brother to the north of us who, because of its positioning, is struck every single year. And that strike may be 0.1% of their, their GDP. But for a country like Dominica or Barbados or Antigua and Barbuda, that is 100, 200, 300% of GDP. And so these are the things that we need to take into account. What the Bridgetown Initiative has sought to do is to give you a roadmap of actions that will get you there. Six basic steps. And what we need now is for the international financial mechanism to respond. There has been some action from the likes of the World Bank, from the IMF, et cetera, but there is more needed. And we also need to understand as well that there are certain other things being brought to play that are also not leveling the playing field, like interpretations of Article 2.1c that focus on low greenhouse gas emissions and forget the, the second part of 2.1c, which deals with climate resilient development and the fact that many adaptation activities are not low GHG aligned. For example, if I'm building a seawall, I'm using high grade marine strength concrete with a high rejection rate, high amount of steel. It is critical for me for my adaptation and protection, but it doesn't meet GHG um, emission, low GHG emission standards. Thanks, thanks. B very insightful. Okay, Matthias, uh, and then we go to a question from the audience. Matthias, please. Uh, no, on this particular topic, I mean, I think that also, I mean, uh, very much like Ricardo said uh, and, and highlighted, I mean, this is, this is indeed why we from the Swedish and the EU side have been so keen to have a more in-depth conversation on Article 21C of the Paris Agreement, because it is precisely these kind of issues which we would want to you know, engage in a further conversation with our, uh, with global partners within the negotiations. There is a lot ongoing outside the negotiations. I mean, as Ricardo pointed to, and I, I mean, I, indeed, I was a bit surprised that we didn't see more of, you know, the conversation about the reform of the international financial system um, coming into COP28. But, but I mean, as as has been highlighted, I mean, those it's, it can be discussed, but I mean, the actions and, and decisions are actually taken outside. And I mean, there have been steps taken throughout the year, partly as a, a response to the call which was issued already at COP27 for the um, for the multilateral development banks, for example, to reform their business models. Uh, I mean, and that work has been ongoing throughout the year. 
Um, but I mean, obviously more can be done. I think that also sort of speaks to not only the usefulness of having a, a, a conversation on 21C on the, of the Paris Agreement within the negotiations, but also this whole concept of the links between climate and development, uh, because it's for us at least, I think, you know, this, this is sort of cuts to the heart of that conversation where we want to see that it's not sort of two separate strands, but it is really, it is part and parcel of the same package, uh, both from a policy point of view, but also from a finance point of view, um, where, you know, we have, you know, in 2015, we should remember that we didn't only set out the or design the Paris Agreement, but also uh, the, the SDGs, as well as the Addis Ababa Development Finance Agenda. And all of these three, you know, taken together, provide us with a pretty good roadmap uh, uh, in terms of how we can be designing policies at the national level to spur both climate and development, but also how we finance those actions in terms of, you know, setting the right kind of investment climate at the national level, securing investments both domestically and international. And I think that sort of, you know, comes back also to, you know, obviously we as development partners stand ready to support our developing country partners with any kind of, you know, the kind of finance uh, that we can provide through our development finance channels. But ultimately the bulk of the finance needed for the transition to net zero is needs to come from, um, from private sources. And in order for that finance to flow, we need to have investment climate in every country, which attracts that kind of investment. I do recognize that, I mean, not least from from a SIDS perspective. I mean, as as uh, as Ricardo highlighted, you know, where storms are becoming more frequent and more intense, and you know, debt burdens are uh, are difficult. Uh, there, there, you know, there's that there are special situations for many countries, and we need to sort of to 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 find those solutions which can speak to um, the kind of challenges that each country faces. But ultimately, this needs to be a conversation about, you know, how do we set in place investment climates which attract the kind of investment necessary? And that, that's not sort of a climate issue. That's a development issue. You know, how do we deal with good governance? How do we need with political stability? How do we deal with corruption? Uh, you know, which are barriers to investments. Uh, you know, when I speak to Swedish financial actors, you know, why aren't you investing more in developing countries? In some cases, it's also about just, you know, the level of awareness. They're not very familiar with these markets. Uh, you know, so how can we also be supporting our investment community in raising that level of, of awareness for them to also see that these are indeed interesting markets, uh, which can provide a good return. Uh, but for that to happen, there also needs to, to be that, that kind of stability in the investment climate, which again, it's not, a, it's not a climate issue. It's not something we will solve within the UNFCCC, but it is sort of a wider development issue, which I think deserves a lot more attention uh, for us to be global, to making progress as a global community. Thank, thank you. Uh, and we will, uh, yes, maybe we return to, to the, the finance also in the next uh, couple of questions. I had three more questions, I think, that we will have time for, but so now, from my end, but the rest is the audience. So uh, the first one from the audience, Tina. Yeah, and it's, of course, really hard to select. There's a lot of interesting questions coming in, many on issues as well that have been discussed. Uh, but I'm going to pose just one question now um, from Luciana Coelho, um, asking the panel, not a specific panel member, but the panel, uh, if you would like to, to comment on the discussion uh, regarding transfer of technology, but also capacity building during the COP or at the COP. So were these topics under discussion? To what extent? They, they haven't been given much attention in the media. Does anyone want to comment on this? I could maybe briefly comment. I mean, uh, there there were um, uh, obviously d discussions on these agenda items as well. Maybe not as highly um, sort of uh, highlighted in in the media as as others. Um, and for some of those, there were also difficulties. I mean, again, on technology transfer. I mean, there's a, always a link to again to finance and how you know how to make sure that there is the finance available to in order for that technology transfer to to be able to happen. Um, but I mean, personally, I would hope that these issues actually could get more attention because they are really two crucial points, both in I mean, in terms of technology transfer. I mean, maybe the term in itself is a bit you know opaque you know what is it actually that we're talking about i think again for us it comes back to you know how can we as global 
partners be able to share and make available the technology which is available um, and you know to spur that kind of te technology development in uh, across countries and that of course also in a way links to capacity building what kind how can we as partners be supporting uh, in terms of capacity development both when it comes to institution institutional building uh, building capacity in terms of knowledge uh, making sure that there are you know the right kind of policies and legislation in place in order to to accelerate action so uh, uh, indeed, I think those are two topics which um, often would deserve more attention than they actually get. Osa. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that. I think um, among the three means of implementation, finance, technology transfer, and capacity building, we tend to focus a lot on finance uh, for many good reasons, but it's unfortunate, I think, to not recognize what we can do and should be doing with technology transfer. Um, we did some research on this ahead of another summit, the Stockholm Plus 50 summit uh, in uh, last year in Stockholm. And we sort of, I mean, that it has become a little bit of, if I can say, like a dormant agenda. Uh, we proposed that maybe we should think of it as co-development of technology instead and, and think, try and, you know, uh, get some new ideas how we can ensure that that. Um, all, all countries and all communities have access to um, to the best possible technology in the end. Um, I think one really alarming uh, finding I saw a while ago was um, uh, UNCTAD had made a sort of assessment that the green transition could actually um, uh, increase the, the innovation gap between uh, developed and developing countries. Um, rather than close it. So I think um, it's it's um, really important that we try and think new about technology transfer or co-development of technology. A couple of initiatives were launched at, uh, at the COP, uh, for example, Sweden-India uh, innovation partnership when it comes to uh, heavy industry emissions and uh, also one between um, the UK and Brazil, I believe. So things are happening, but um, yes, I think we need to uh, turn much more attention to this, both from a, from a research point of view and a policy point of view. Thanks. Uh, and we will uh, have, I see there are many interesting questions in the panel, so we will, uh, I will try to speed up the last part of the, this uh, post-match analysis, too, so we have time for some more questions in the end. Uh, Ricardo, I would like to uh, return to you. You mentioned the loss and damage as one of the, the, the great outcomes from, from this. Uh, so, And the swift handling was indeed hailed as a success. But was it a success in content as well? You seem to imply that. Um, I think it was. Um, from the perspective of someone who was involved in the discussions, I, I don't think that any of the parties actually got exactly what they wanted. Um, at the end of the day, but I think that what you see is really what was a hard fought outcome. And it was something that all of the parties um, more or less could agree on and that it represented for all of us a very positive step towards addressing the critical issue of loss and damage. As you know, um, when you look at what was there, you had coverage for mitigation and for adaptation, but the reality is that we have failed globally to mitigate. It means that there's a greater need for adaptation and that adaptation cannot be as effective or efficient. And so as a result, loss and damage will occur. And I think that it was a combination of the hard work of the individuals involved, their commitment, but also the fact that this is going to go down as the hottest year on record. And we have seen some horrific um, disasters and, and, crisis, and crises um, on the international scale. Um, so it was very clear that we needed that agreement, that it was recognized that the agreement itself was very fragile and that you needed to get it over the line as soon as possible. For those who were in the room um, when that decision was made, there was an immediate pause and all of the parties who were involved as 
transaction transitional committee members as well as advisors walked over to each other there were congratulatory hugs um there were kisses there were tears there was laughter it ran the gamut of emotions but i think that it represented an incredible outcome i think if you speak to anybody who was involved in that process they will tell you that it was a very proud moment that everybody who has been a part of that see each other as part of a family but you will not hear any of us say that we want to relive it again so please nobody suggest that that is how we address anything else going forward under climate finance thank you ricardo what's that? what's your do you agree uh, yes, I think this was, again, historic, given the sensitivities around loss and damage that we have seen since the uh, start of the Climate Convention. Um, I think what's the, is, is, actually, my first uh, contact with the uh, climate negotiations was uh, when I was studying the Adaptation Fund, when it was established back in 2007. And very similar, I think, um, type of discussion, concerns about governance, uh, some sort of uh, you know ambiguity. What exactly is the fund gonna um, finance? What kind of projects? What is adaptation? So I, I see a lot of parallels, but also so it's interesting now to look at the adaptation fund. It is a successful fund. It has found its niche. I think it is perceived as sort of working uh, well and and sort of being fair, etc. So that gives me hope that this loss and damage fund will also find its you know a good place in this um, landscape of climate finance uh, and funds. Okay, speaking of adaptation, then uh, another theme that perhaps wasn't, but who wasn't as swiftly uh, uh, dealt with was the global goal and adaptation. Matthias, you you were one of the co chairs of, of, of that track. Uh, it was fraught with conflicts, which we might have anticipated to see more of in, in the lot and loss and damage, but it was common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. It was uh, Finance. It was the different fee themes that, that were, were discussed, and and I saw some analysis from some observers who said that they suspected that it was tactics from some countries' part, like the like-minded developing countries or the Arab group, to to stall the negotiations. Uh, as one of the co-chairs, would you? What's your assessment of why the global goal of adaptation was so fraught with conflicts? Is there? Well, I mean, the, the conversations over the past two years have been um, difficult at times, where there have been different perspectives on sort of how how do you how we want the, the global goal on adaptation to be framed. Is it sort of a, a bottom up approach where we will be doing a sort of designing global goal where uh, we primarily support the development on the national level of the kind of policies and, and uh, actions which countries can take or is this more sort of a sort of designing these kind of more top level glo global goals which then uh, would be sort of the guiding star for for uh, the development of the goal and those in some way i guess those two perspectives have have now been merged in 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 the decision which came out of cop 28 so i mean eventually parties managed to agree on that but yes i mean just as my in my experience as the as the co-facilitated during the first week, it, it, there was indeed uh, it was very clear towards the end of that first week, especially that some parties were uh, not willing to engage basically in the conversation. I mean that was uh, and I mean the the groups that you mentioned, uh, both the Arab group and the the, the LMDCs, uh, you know, which whichever way we tried to get text over the line um there was no agreement for you know from that from their side to engage so i perceive that as a you know it was a, a tactic if you like uh in terms of um having that conversation primarily during the during the course of the second week but why should not uh come about different responsibilities and respective capabilities be part of the the global goal of adaptation well, I mean, I, I must say, for me personally, that is a bit of a. Uh, it's it's um, 
No, it, it comes back sort of in, in a way to the question which Ricardo highlighted also previously in sort of the relationship between the COP and the CMA and, and the Convention and the Paris Agreement. Uh, because, I mean, these are principles which are enshrined in the Convention and hence also are part of the Paris Agreement itself. Um, but I think the, the fear from many developed countries in making those kind of references in the global goal itself uh, was that that in its way would sort of cement the kind of division of parties which we have had since the 90s, you know, when the convention was signed. And obviously, you know, the world has developed since then, thank God, in many ways, uh, you know, where the this the, the sort of the, the so-called annexes we have uh, to the convention um, makes very clear, you know, which are developed and which are developing countries, which represents the world worldview that we, you know, at least from a, from a, from an EU perspective, we do not really think is sort of the, the current worldview as as it is, you know, not both when it comes to emission, but also when it comes to economic development, um, and and again that question cuts to finance because you know the fear I think was that if you repeat these kind of principles so very clearly, there is also you know a fear that that would be sort of cementing this kind of um, provider provision uh, uh, aspect of, of finance, saying, you know, it is the developed countries according to the annexes of the convention, which are the constant providers of climate finance. You know, we talk to colleagues from Saudi Arabia, they say that we are the fifth largest provider of climate finance. Why can't we just recognize that? You know, instead of having this um, basically construed debate around, you know, who, who are the providers? Uh, so I think that's sort of why the, there was that conversation about the, the CBDR principles in, in, in the global goal and adaptation. Uh, but I mean, eventually we, we, got, we got a result. Uh, and uh, I think you know, we're also looking forward to the conversations on the, on the new goal on, on finance next year, where we hope to be, to be able to recognize that you know, the world has moved on since 1990. Uh, and there is a wider scope of countries which can, can now actually can provide finance to uh, to the group of countries which are in need of finance, you know, including like the UAE. Yeah, we saw the, the commitment and the contribution to the loss and damage fund, for example. Thanks. Uh, Ricardo. Thank you so much. It, it was an issue at COP that I tried my level best to keep as far away from as I could. And unfortunately, I was pulled into it nonetheless because um, my minister ended up being the AOSIS champion on the GGA. Um, but what I wanted to speak about really is the fact that you will see certain things recurring. The issue of CBDR, um, the issue of um, how do you interpret Article 2.1c, um, the issue of COP versus CMA versus CMP. Um, but the thing that I think we needed to ensure did not happen at this COP was that any of the country's hands were tied by what was reflected under the GGA or the GST going into the next year, which is the final year on the new collective quantified goal on climate finance, the NCQG. And I think that what we had at the end of the day, thanks to Matthias and, and, and others, and thanks to the ministers in that second week, is a text that, as we say in the space, we could live with and we can work with. And I think that that is setting us up um, so that the, the big issue for the next COP is going to be the agreement on the new um, collective quantified goals on climate finance, and I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately, I find myself caught up in those discussions in a significant way as well. Um, so I think that that is also going to say to you that that is one of the critical things that you need to look forward to um, going into COP29 as it relates to the overall COP, to climate finance, and to what will be the goal to replace the 100 billion goal. I think we are very fortunate that you are involved in those processes anyway. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, so I have one final question before we we uh, we turn to more questions to the audience, and, and that is the global stock take. So to me personally, I think that the, what 
the outcome of how we will assess the outcome from COP28, it will be how the global stock takes is, is taken forward and that we get a, get a credible process there. Uh, Maria, uh, do we have, was that sufficient in the, in, in, in the agreement on the global stock take to, to have a credible process forward in the next uh, years to come, to go from word to action? Well, only a lot of difficult questions here, Bjurla. Um, I think that one part, an important part is, of course, what is in the GST text. So therefore, we see, see all these discussions on how do you frame the transition away or phase out or phase down or or not at all. Um, and I think that the, the current or the text that came out of the GST um, has some interesting wording around transition away, but also that it's so specific in terms of listing the types of actions that are countries are expected to or called upon to contribute to. Uh, and I think it will, um, so it mentions for those of you who have not like looked super closely at the GST, GST text, it mentions the transition away from the fossil fuels, but also um, facing down unabated coal power and tripling renewables as also mentioned before. So it lists a lot of things. And I think that that will be interesting to see how that is uh, taken forward in terms of the specificity of, of the language, which is different from the Paris Agreement in itself, which was more general the targets. But the other important part of the GST is, of course, how is it taken forward? And what does being informed by the GST mean in terms of updating the NDCs, the National Climate Plans? And since this is the first GST under the Paris Agreement, we haven't seen that play out yet. Um, so I think that it will be really interesting to see in the, the next round of NBCs in 2025, how or to what extent um, countries actually reflect the GST. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that the same type of dynamic that we've heard here about the negotiations also play out in the NDCs, where some would refer to the GST text as a whole, while some might pick out a few of the, the paragraphs that they want to emphasize their importance. Um, so I think that that's, it's really hard to tell, I think, um, but of course it's an important part as this is the, the main like ratchet up mechanism of the Paris Agreement, which the whole agreement uh, kind of builds on to actually increase ambition. Matthias, you sleep well at night, resting assured that we have a good process the next two years on the DSP. <sighs> Well, in, we we at least need to make sure that we do have a good process. I mean, we, we have a, a couple of pointers in the decision itself. There will be a dialogue at the so-called SP sessions in Bonn this year, which sort of starts sort of starts us out, out basically in, in terms of implementing the GST decision. Um, but then, of course, you know, in, in the end, it will be up to us as parties to fill that with substance. And I mean, I would hope that we from the EU side will be coming forward with ideas and thoughts on how we see that the GST process will evolve in terms of in terms of implementation. I mean, we from the EU side uh, are expecting also a um, a suggestion from the European Commission already in February in terms of our new 2040 target, will, which eventually then will um, form the basis of the next EU NDC to be presented ahead of, of uh, COP30 in 2025. But I mean, these will be two intense years where, you know, we um, have, will be working to both prepare our own NDC within the EU, but then, of course, also supporting and encouraging countries globally in terms of preparations of their uh, of their indices. And again, you know, coming back to, you know, where the bulk of the emissions are, 80% of global emissions are from the G20. So how can we ensure that the G20 indices are in line with 1.5 and making those steps in terms of being economy-wide all gases and also representing a progression? And here again, you know, how, making sure that we have, make best use of the process we already have. We have the mitigation work program. We now have the, the global goal and adaptation. We have the just transition work program. We have a number of finance agenda items, including the new goal and hopefully also a more in-depth conversation on 21C and the transition of financial flows. So how can we make sure that all of these work programs also support the both elaboration of NDCs, but then ultimately, of course, the implementation of those NDCs once they have been presented in 2025? Thank, thanks so much. Well, let's, uh, with that, turn to some more questions from the audience, Tina, before we wrap up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, we, we have two questions on Article 6.5, which um, I'm 
picking out here. Um, the first one is that um, the EU is rather critical of the guidelines that the Article 6.4 supervisory body had drafted for carbon dioxide removal projects. Um, and what are the prospects that the EU's concerns about the quality of carbon removal credits will be met at future UNFCCC conferences? Um, I have a feeling that maybe Matthias also <laughs> wants to uh, take a first step at this. There's um, a, yeah, a, ge a more general question on Article 6.5 that is directed to Ricardo. Maybe you can take that after. Is the, like your general view on the lack of progress on Article 6.5. But maybe, Matthias, if you want to start. Sure, happy to. And I think we have to be working harder from the EU side to be sharing our concerns when it comes to uh, the design of the Article 6 framework. I mean, we, we concluded the rule book in Glasgow. So basically, we have sort of the general rules in place. But now we sort of we need to work on these on these final details as well to ensure the integrity of carbon markets uh, and making sure that, you know, we're not double counting and, and that actually whenever we do Article 6 projects that they actually do contribute to higher uh, global ambition. Um, so, you know, those we, we, we said ahead of COP26 in Glasgow that, you know, we'd rather have a no deal than a bad deal. And the same, I mean, that was sort of the same approach we took here that we don't want to decide on rules which we will be, you know, which we will be having for a foreseeable future. Uh, so, um, um, but but we, I mean, from the Swedish side, we are also very much engaged in Article 6 and we've, our energy agency has been working to conclude agreements with a number of countries in terms of setting those kind of pilot schemes in motion. So, of course, we have an interest to ensure that there is uh, these global rules being decided. So I think that's something for us to work on now during the course of next year to, to synthesize our partners in terms of what we do really need to have in place in order to have high integrity carbon markets. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Honestly, Article 6 is one of those things that I try to keep very far away from. I have a colleague um, who sits um, in that space and I have um, a colleague who many know um, quite well who's passed away, unfortunately, um, that being Hugh Seeley, who also used to work in that space. Um, the reality is, from our perspective, um, we're, we're looking for as fair a market as possible while understanding that for many of us, um, there there is not much out there in that respect. For a country like mine, for instance, Barbados, with a very ambitious NDC, um, it, it leaves us with very little um, in the way of carbon credits that we could potentially work from. But it would be remiss of me not to speak to some of the concerns of one of my sister countries in the region, um, and that being the Bahamas. The Bahamas has um, the largest expanse of seagrass beds in the world. And there's little or nothing that they're in a position to gain relative to carbon credits in spite of what they want to do to seek to continue to protect the seagrass beds and ensure that they continue to exist because they find it very difficult to prove additionality. And there is a, a good reason for needing to prove additionality and to ensure that the market itself um, operates in a fair manner. But what then happens is that you get a number of countries like the Bahamas who are being squeezed in that overall process where they would like to be able to utilize their seagrass beds, to have them recognized for the purpose that they serve in terms of carbon sequestration, but also to be able to monetize um, that asset and their protection of that asset. And that speaks to a broader issue where um, when you look at the, the Red Plus and you look at the issues that have occurred there, but there's a lot presented for terrestrial opportunities for carbon sequestration. For countries like those in the Caribbean and other small island states, where we're essentially more large ocean, and where, for instance, in the, the case of Barbados, our marine space is 424 times the size of our terrestrial space but there are very few blue or ocean related carbon methodologies that are registered. And I think that that is one of the things that we need to look at effectively. 
perhaps we can also add a 6.5 is that we should not double count the emission reduction. So if they're included in the emissions trading, the, the host country who, who is issuing those credits. Yeah, yeah. So, so the issue of 6.4 and 6.5 are therefore very much linked in that respect. Um, and I think that there are concerns globally relative to double counting, relative to greenwashing, et cetera, that we need to be able to address. But I think um, others can tell you that when it comes to Article 6, the rest of us are very pleased to let them go off into their little rooms and disappear for practically the duration of COP before they surface invariably, especially 6.4, on the very, very last day with some sort of agreement script together. Thank you. Okay, uh, so let's see where we are on time. Yes, we could at least have one more question, Tina. Um, yes, um, now that makes it hard. <laughs> I was expecting to have more. But um, we have a question that is more of the general uh, scope, maybe on on given the what what was already also mentioned, the the different reactions to the to the final final text that when it was approved from the huge progress to the step backwards. Um, and the question here is within the realm of what is politically feasible, but also given the constraints of the framework, what are the best outcomes that you would see that could have been possible in this COP? And maybe we can also see see this uh, to, to, to COP29. So um, the question here from, from the uh, audience is, in other words, what kind of ambition or signals is reasonable to expect at all from COPs? Osa, would you like to take that one? I think that's a really good question, and um, I think we're <laughs> every year at this at this time of year we're in that you know with the cup uh, half uh, a glass half full or half empty, and you can you know there's not one correct answer uh, obviously, but I think in you know as as I see the cup it's it's a consensus uh, process. What it can do is to raise the the lowest common denominator, so that's the significance of it. Of course, we want many. Uh, countries or, or actors to run fast ahead and show what is possible and, and inspire and take risks, etc. So I guess maybe I am I would have uh, rather lower expectations of COPs. Having said that, I think I just want to, maybe this is my final comment also, I just want to reconnect to something very important said by Maria Janas initially on the implementation gap, because now uh, with the GST, we have been discussing how can that raise ambition, sort of looking forward the next cycle of NDCs. As Matthias said, the EU is now working on a 2040 target proposal. Um, that part of the process seems to work. I also think that what Emma said about you know this this idea of a market fair or the COP as a meeting place for discussing solutions between business. Uh, government authorities, civil society, I think that also works and we need to have those climate implementation summits, if you like. What is maybe a little bit weak still in this whole process is the climate accountability summit. So, you know, actually following up how we're doing on the targets that we have already committed to. And as we saw yesterday, uh, the European Commission says that the EU member states are not yet on track to achieve the um, 2030 target to reduce emissions by 55 percent uh, it's something like 51 percent is the current outlook so I think that's really important to not forget and that's also actually one of my um, um, one of the reasons I went to COP was to meet with other climate policy councils as national level institutions to actually ensure that we, we meet the targets that we have already set so I think that's an increasingly important part course of, of climate action and it would be interesting to in another webinar discuss how can you know we reform the process so we actually do a better job of evaluating and following up and learning from that thank you great and we have many other super interesting questions but we have to save them and but we encourage the panelists to take a look and all the audience to take a look at the questions because that, that will be super interesting to continue such a conversation elsewhere uh, because now it's time to wrap up and my last question to you would have been if the if the dubai consensus sort of the, the name of this agreement coming out from from cop 28 uh, no it's the uae consensus right yeah 
UA consensus. Uh, would raise the ambitions uh, on climate action, but you seem to think so. So my question to you instead is, what mechanisms are the primary drivers? What what is most the most important mechanisms in this consensus that will drive ambition? If you think I, I interpreted your answers right, that it will drive ambition. If not, you can correct me. So should we start with the order that we started in, then, Maria? Sure. Um... Yes, I think that one of the main things, of course, is going to be the NDCs uh, in tiers. That's where we're going to see the ambitions, hopefully aligned with the 1.5. But I think that next year with the uh, transparency report is going to be interesting uh, with these, as Matthias mentioned, the national reports on how countries are actually doing on implementing their, their NDCs and reflecting upon the, the discussions that we've had here too, that it's not about just reaching ambitions uh, but also about implementation. So I think in that sense, transparency reports coming over the course of next year uh, are going to be interesting. Thanks. Short and sweet, because we have about one minute per person now. So that's great. Uh, Matthias. I think very much along the same lines as Maria just said, you know, and also what also was saying in terms of the, the climate policy councils, for example, which are being set up, you know, how do we, how can we at the global level support the elaboration and implementation of national systems to uh, national institutions to uh, to spur action uh, on the national level. You know, setting out the right kind of regulations and policies, ensuring that there's finance in place, and 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 uh, highlighting whatever's the, the kind of innovative technology that that is available to support the implementation of those kind of policies, and making maybe sort of the accountability framework work on a national level uh, instead of, of the global level where it might be more difficult. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you so much. I believe I'm having some issues here with the mute. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, excellent. Um, I think yes, but there are two um, caveats that I would put there. Um, one, the need not just for revised and more ambitious NDCs, but the need for us to be very clear how we're going to address both the conditional and the unconditional component in NDCs. Because um, I think for many developing countries, there's a large component of their NDC that is conditional. And so you need to look at opportunities for financing in that respect. And then of course, the other one is, is still the NCQG. Um, we need to have that ambitious new goal um, that is centered on public finance because public finance is what can be guaranteed. Um, there is certainly a, a, a significant role for private finance and climate financing going forward. But I think the, the discomfort from the developing country level is one in which when you have an over-reliance on private finance, that you cannot control, that you're going to have issues in that respect. So I think new NDCs, um, ways in which we're going to address the conditional component of NDCs and an ambitious new collective quantified goal on climate finance going forward. Thank you. Uh, Emma? I would agree uh, on the transition uh, reports, definitely. And also what has been highlighted earlier regarding the GST and how they're centered around uh, the importance of the, um, I mean, the fact that we cover, they cover every part of the negotiation so that they can be, I mean, the NDCs can be even more actionable and also more transparent. But I do also would like to touch upon the fact what um, uh, Oasa also mentioned. And I would think that the importance of bridging the implementation gaps are being best done by breaking the silos between the interconnecting stakeholders and really make sure that we are rethinking the process of making sure that the interconnecting stakeholders are being yeah, meet each other and that we can match make uh, the challenges and the solutions moving forward. Thanks, Emma. And uh, Osa, you get the final word. I already used my minute before, so I will just say thank you everyone for really great questions. That's it. Fantastic, Osa. And I can say thank you to all. I started out with saying this was a fantastic panel. I think I was more than right. I this uh, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for your contributions and all your insights here. It's been 
extremely rewarding for my for myself and, and I learned a lot and I hope that's the same for the audience. Thank you also for everybody online that engaged in questions, which was really, really good questions, time questions that we will keep on thinking about. I would particularly though like to thank uh, the communications team at Stockholm Environment Institute, Maria Cole and Alicia Polishuk, uh, and also at the Linköping University with Tina Nieset, which you've already seen, but also Baila Chibbe, who has done a fantastic job in organizing this. Without them, this would have not have happened. So thank you so much, Ilva. Also, thank you so much, everybody, for making it possible. So great job. And I look forward to see you all next year after the COP29 post-match analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much.